I'm thankful tonight for being in the house of God. And I want to give honor to God tonight. I give honor to his son, Jesus. I give honor to the gift of the Holy Spirit. I give honor to Bishop Joseph White tonight, for the founder and presiding bishop of the Church of Living God International. I give honor tonight to the board of directors. I give honor tonight to <clears throat> Elder Walter Jones, our district superintendent, to Assistant Pastor Harris, and to all of you tonight here in person and those that are watching online. And even though my voice is going away, I'm going to still keep trying to sing and making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Because I'm believing that he does hear us when we sing and he sees us when we clap and that there's a reward in heaven. And I used to sing for the world, was never good at it, but I was singing worldly songs and things. There was no reward in heaven for that. So I want to encourage you tonight. What little bit you can do, do it unto God and he'll remember you. Amen. Amen. I'm glad to be here in this Bible study tonight as we continue the series, The Mind of Christ. So tonight, the topic is The Mind of Christ, Part 2. The Mind of Christ, Part 2. I ask that you would turn to St. John tonight. St. John, Chapter 6. And we know that our memory scriptures are over in Philippians 2 and 5 through 8. And the Bible tells us in those scriptures that, that to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, and how he was in the form of God, and he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. And he took on the form of a servant, servant, and he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so this mind of Christ is going to be, we're going to be going deep into that so we can expound on Philippians 2, 5 through 8. We can really understand what the mind of Christ is so that we can start to, to pray and ask God to give us the mind of Christ and everything. Amen. So tonight we're going to start out in St. John 6 and 35. When you get there, please say amen. 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 St. John 6 and 35. And the Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. So Jesus let the people know, said, if you believe on me, you shall never hunger and you shall never thirst. And, and he's referring to how if you believe on him, I won't get too far ahead of myself, but how if you believe on him the right way, then you can receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost can, can be there with you, be there for you, and God becomes your God. And then God can supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So Jesus knew that if, according to God's plan, if you believed on him the right way, then God can become your God. Then he can supply all your need. So then you would never hunger nor thirst for the things that you need in this life because God can supply those things. So that's what he was getting to. So people have seen Jesus in illustrations. They've seen him in paintings. They've seen him in movies. And most of all, we see him in our minds through the word of God. It's, it's the word of God describes him in his life. And so when Jesus said in 36, he said, you have seen me and believe not. Now these people, they actually saw him in person. But for us, seeing him not, we still believe. And so I have seen the president, but I have not seen the president. I have seen him in pictures and in books and online, but I've never seen him with my own eyes in person. And that's how we have to see Jesus this day. See him through the word of God, see him through how we see him, but not having seen him with our own eyes, we have to believe. And so when people, a lot of times these days when people believe, they believe on another Jesus. I'm going to say that again. And we're going to go to that scripture. A lot of times in this modern time, when they believe on Jesus, they believe on another Jesus. So let's go over to, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. Because we're talking about having the mind of Christ tonight. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. And then we're going to come back to St. John. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. So Jesus said that if you've seen him, many have seen him and they believe not. So that means they have seen him or heard him even in these days and times. But the conclusion is many people 
still don't believe him. So over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 3, when you get there, please say amen. Amen. And the Bible says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly, I can't say that word right tonight, but that's all right. He was slick. I'm going to translate that. So the Bible saying, he said, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through being slick and smooth, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So the Bible tells us that when anyone, because it said if he that cometh, preaches another Jesus, a Jesus where the gospel they're preaching, it may come from the same Bible, but this Jesus they're preaching is not the one that when you believe on, that you may never thirst, you may never hunger. But this Jesus they may preach is not the one that says, marvel not, you must be born again. And so with this, if we believe on Jesus as the scriptures have said, then we won't find ourselves being one of the people believing on another Jesus. In this real Jesus, the one that has the mind of God, which was telling us that we have the mind of Christ, this Jesus, he said that if we believe on him as the scripture have said, out of our belly shall flow a river of living water, which is the Holy Spirit. So if we believe on this Jesus, then he will pray the Father that we will have the Holy Ghost. But if it's another Jesus, as I finish up in four before we go on, then you will receive another spirit, which is not the Holy Spirit. So when I was in church, talking about the mind of Christ tonight, I received another spirit that had me fighting in church and had me still cussing this, that, and the other. And it's good to know these things so we can understand what happened. What happened to us, those of us that grew up in church or been in church and we were not saved, what was going on? Why? Would, how is it possible you can hear about Jesus in the Bible and still not be saved? It was because it was another spirit. And then it says another gospel. And that's why the Bible, when it talks about the gospel for Jesus, it says the gospel of your salvation. So the gospel of this Jesus that we're talking about tonight, the true son of God, his gospel is the gospel of your salvation. Talking about the mind of Christ tonight. So if you turn back with me, we're going to go back to, to St. John 6. St. John 6 and 36. And Jesus again said, But I say unto you that ye, have, ye also have seen me and believe not. So think about that in your mind as we continue. They had Jesus in front of him. They had Jesus walking with him. They had Jesus... Um, performing miracles. They had him multiply the fishes and the loaves and, and all these different things, and they still didn't believe him. He was right there. So, so today, when he's not right in front of us, how much easier is it to not believe? How much easier is it to have another Jesus if he's not actually right here with us? How much easier is it to have another gospel, another mind, another spirit that's not the mind of Christ? So tonight, talking about this mind of Christ, as we continue on, it says in 37, Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up. Again, in the last day, Jesus is letting us know tonight that he came to do the Father's will. And that God's will is that he should lose nothing. He should lose not one person that comes to him and believes on him the right way. He wanted to encourage the people. He said, if you do believe on me, as the scriptures have said, one, you won't hunger and thirst because then you have the Holy Ghost and God will be your God and he'll supply all your needs. He said, but then also, we're, I'm able to keep you. I want to let you know tonight as we continue, this Jesus, he's able to keep you. Because God has told him that he will lose nothing, that he will lose not one person that comes to him. And so take comfort in that tonight, that on our part, 
our part, it is just for us to believe on Jesus as the scriptures have said, to take this mind of Christ, and then you can make it to heaven. If you turn with me to Leviticus, going to the Old Testament, Leviticus 11 and 44. The reason we're going to the Old Testament talking about this mind of Christ is that Jesus just told us that he came down from heaven to do the Father's will. And we've been learning that the, the mind that Jesus had was his Father's mind. It was God's mind. And it was given to him by God through the Holy Spirit. And God taught him and he filled him with the Spirit. And Jesus walked in the power of the Spirit. And Jesus said the things that he did, he said that we would do greater things. Not because we're greater than Jesus, but he said because I go away. He said, I'm going back to where I came from. And I'm going to give you the same Holy Ghost that I used to perform the miracles. And if you keep my commandments, he said, I'll pray to Father that you will receive that spirit. So going into Leviticus, I'm diving deep into this mind that Jesus had tonight. Leviticus 11 and 44. When you get there, please say amen. Amen. So, so we're, we're now talking about the mind that God has, that he gave Jesus. And this is God in Leviticus. He says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. First thing to point out in this verse is, he said, For I am the Lord your God. So he's talking to, in this verse, the people that already belong to him. He said, I am the Lord, your God. And he says, since I am your God, you have to sanctify yourselves and be ye holy. And don't defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing. And this creeping thing is anything. It can be people. But then in the next verse, 45, he says, for I am the Lord that brought you out, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So this covers even everybody else in this modern time. The ones that are not saved, God is saying, his mindset is, he wants to bring you out of sin, bring you out of your situation, that he can be your God. So the first one was, I am your God, for those that are saved, be holy. The second one is, I want to be your God and be holy. I want to be your God that... You can be holy. And so that's the mind that Jesus had was that everyone could be saved. It wasn't just for the Jews because they were already the people of God. But it was also for us, the Gentiles, all of us who had no promise, who had no hope, as the Bible says, who were without God in the world. God said, one day I'm going to save you all as well because I want to be your God and you have to be holy. Talking about this mind of Christ tonight. So, so Christ's mind is save everybody. So if we want to take on this mind of Christ, as Philippians said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, then we should have the mind, not only should I be saved, but I want everybody to be saved. I want my family to be saved. I want my daughters to be saved. I want my grandson to be saved. I want my mother to be saved. I want my coworkers, my best friends. I want my enemies to be saved. I want the stranger that prepared my meal to be saved. Because that is the mind of Christ. That is the mind that God has concerning us. If you turn with me tonight, over to Romans 12 and 1. So God's mind, in Jesus' mind, is for everyone to be holy. For everyone to be saved. Over to Romans 12 and 1 tonight. Talking about the mind of Christ. So these key points about the mind of Christ. It's for us to, to begin to ask God to let us let that mind in. And as we begin to learn more about the mind and begin to see how deep this is, then we have a greater understanding of what God's expectations are. It's not what Pastor Harris's expectations are or anybody else's of this world, but it's what God expects of us for us to be able to make it to where heaven and actually enter into the kingdom so god has expectations and he he wants us to make it there and enter in so over in romans 12 and 1 the bible says i beseech you therefore 
Tonight I beseech you, therefore, knowing the mind of Christ, knowing that God wants to save everybody, ourselves included, knowing that he said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. Tonight we're here by the mercies of God. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind of Christ was that everyone would have their mind renewed, that everyone would be transformed, that everyone would live holy. So we have to present this body, and that's everything about us, this body, everything about us. We have to present this body unto God at all times. And it has to be holy and acceptable unto God, and our, our life should prove, not just to ourselves, but unto others, what is that perfect will of God. Everywhere you go, your life should prove what is the perfect will of God. Everything you say should prove what God's perfect will is. The things you don't do should prove what God's perfect will is. And that's why we have to follow the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the power of God. He has to lead us and guide us and give us the mind of Christ so that in everything we do, we can prove what is that good and perfect will of God. When we have to talk to people, whether they're good, bad, nice, indifferent, whether they dress like we don't like, whatever it is, even if it's something that we do like and we're attracted to them, we have to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. And you can only do that by the Holy Ghost. So otherwise we'll walk in the flesh and we'll prove what is our own perfect will. So the Bible goes on tonight. In verse 3 it says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We're going to hover in this a little bit tonight. It says, think soberly. First it says, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. A lot of times we preach and teach this according to us thinking about ourselves compared to other people. I think I'm better than you, better than, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. This highly than we all think is according to if we're saved and how much faith we have. It says to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. To think about your own measure of faith, to think soberly about it. Be real about it, realistic about it. Have the understanding of your measure of faith. That way you can understand where you need help. Think soberly about it. I can't be up here saying, I'm all that in a bag of chips, and I got it all together. I got to think soberly about it, so then I say, well, I still need help, Lord, in this, thus, and thus. Think soberly about it, and it's according to your measure of faith. It's the measure of faith that God has given each of you is not according to anything external. It's not according to my opinion of you. It's not according to what you're actually doing in the house of God, but it's your measure of faith. And when we do this, and we think soberly about our faith, we begin to wonder in ourselves, well, where I am in my faith in God, how much has my faith changed me? Where am I in the faith? Where am I in this mind of Christ? Christ was always tested. Jesus was tested. His faith was tested. If thou be the son of God, do this, this, and this. So as we continue, we have to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. And that scripture comes from, well, before I get there, this, this, this thing is soberly about our faith. There was a time over in Luke, and we don't have to turn there because we're going to turn somewhere else, but over in Luke 17 and 5, the scripture simply says, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. That was Luke 17 and 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. The apostles. Think about that. Not just somebody. The apostles. They told Jesus, 
Lord, increase our faith because they begin to look at their faith soberly. If they had not done that, they would have said, well, we got this. We're the apostles. We walk with you. We eat with you. You teach us directly. They said, no, in this thing, we need you to increase our faith. And so if you turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, talking about having the mind of Christ, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. And Jesus was always looking for God to do more for the people. He was always looking for God to, to continue to save and continue to deliver. And over in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. It says, examine yourself. Let's think it soberly. God already knows, but do we know where we are in the faith? Day by day, week by week, months pass, years pass. How much have we examined ourselves? I'm finding out as I walk closer to the Lord, as we walk closer to the Lord, the more we examine ourselves, it should cause us to want more of God. You should say, well, Lord, I know I need prayer. I know I need help. I know I need strength. I know I need to prophesy. I know I need to travel. I know whatever it is because you have examined yourself. It says, "Do you, it says, know ye not your own selves? Talking about the mind of Christ tonight. And it says, but I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. I, I, I'm trusting tonight. God is trusting tonight. Jesus is trusting tonight. The Holy Ghost is trusting tonight. One, that you will examine yourself and that you won't be a reprobate. But also that the people that you see in this pulpit, this pulpit that we're not reprobates. That we are actually talking about this same Jesus. That we're actually talking about the gospel of your salvation. He said, I trust it. I trust that as you examine yourself that you're going to see as well that God has brought you further than where you started out. Sometimes Satan gets a hold of us because we haven't examined ourselves in a while. And we don't realize we're stronger today than we were yesterday. Stronger this year than we were last year. Closer to God this year than we were five years ago. And if you turn with me tonight, we're going to go right back to Romans 12. Talking about this mind of Christ tonight. Church isn't just about making us feel good. There are many churches that don't even have Bible study. There are organizations that have never had Bible study. There are doctrines that don't believe in Bible study. And I'm finding this out with, with people all over the world. And so they're not even studying to show themselves approved of God. A workman that need not be ashamed when? And work, no, in that great day of the judgment. But that's not us tonight. That's why we're not reprobates. Because we are here tonight, and those that are watching online are going to be watching, trying to draw closer to God. So going back to Romans 12 and round about the third verse, I'm going to finish that one up again and move right along. Romans 12. So we're going to look soberly according to the measure of faith that we then when you begin to see, do I really pray as much as I should pray? How many years have I been saying I'm going to pray or I'm going to fast or I'm going to believe and I actually don't? So it says in verse 4, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. And every one member is one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. With a prophecy, let us prophesy. It says according to the proportion of faith. It's talking about that faith again and how we have to examine ourselves to see not only whether we be in the faith, but where we are in our faith. So first, whether we be in the faith, are we in a church that has this same Jesus? Not as it said before earlier tonight, another Jesus. Not as it said before, another spirit. 
or another gospel. And this is all from the word of God. But after we examine ourselves, see whether we be in the faith, and the answer is yes, then you say, well, where am I in my faith? Because when you're in the faith, God gives you a measure of faith that's just for you. And there's one faith in God. That's what the Bible says. Get in it. And then examine yourself and say, well, where am I? I like to keep stuff simple. One through ten, where am I? Start out at a zero. No faith. Make it to level one. Level two. Jesus told them one time, he said, oh, ye a little faith. He didn't throw them away. He said, basically, I have examined your faith. I'm glad you're here. You are in the faith. You're doing the right thing. You're going the right direction. But he wanted to let them know that they had a little faith. Which then should tell them, well, as they said later on, as the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. That's why we come to church. It should be more than just coming here and checking the box, but we should really examine ourselves to see where we are in the faith that God has given us. Then it says think soberly about that. So when I found out I was a level two back in Georgia and I had to think soberly, I was like, good Lord, I'm not going to make it in at a level two. Because they told me the Bible says scarcely the righteous be saved. And I said, well, it's scarcely the righteous be saved, and I'm barely righteous. Oh, you a little faith? That's what Jesus was telling me? I said, well, let me think soberly about this. The Lord come back. I'm still level two. I ain't going to make it. Help me. Strengthen me. Feel me, Lord. Change me. Level two, I'm not singing. I'm not dancing. I'm not clapping. I'm not praying. Barely. Lord, work on me. Save me. The Bible says Jesus is able to save to the uttermost because he ever liveth. So when you are level one, two, and three, Jesus liveth to make intercessions for you and me. And say, well, Lord, just keep them. Bring them back. Try them again. Strengthen him or her. Raise them up. And so when we get to this point here, it's saying that it's according to the proportion of faith. So if my faith isn't strong enough, high enough, deep enough, and leveled up enough for me to be doing these things, the Bible said tonight, ask God to increase your faith. Ask God for the mind of Christ. It says in verse 7, in, we're in Romans chapter 12 tonight, 12 and 7, it says, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him give it, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Is listing these different things of how we're supposed to live. And that's why I earlier said, examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. There was a time I didn't have cheerfulness in a lot of things. So instead of me staying my uncheerful self, which is what I was at the time. Uncheerful because my dad died when I was 10, left me without a father. My mother never married or anything, so just fatherless. Then I found out one day that I can have a new father, and his name is God. And he would be better than my earthly father could have ever been. Could have had the best father in the world, but he can't outgive God. He can't deliver me like God. He can't save my soul like God. So, so I began to be cheerful about certain things, and when I found myself and I was not doing things. I was not giving with simplicity. I was not doing whatever it was that's in this list. I began to ask God. Verse 9, the Bible says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. The Bible says, Cleave to that which is good. And for tonight's definition, the word, the definition that we're going to define is cleave. So I try to give one good definition in there for, for Bible study every once in a while so that everyone will have the same understanding. So the so Bible says, and all you're getting, get an understanding. That's what the Bible says. So tonight, our one word is cleave, C-L-E-A-V-E. -E. And the definition of cleave is to adhere firmly and closely or loyally and unwaveringly, I'll read that again. The word cleave means to adhere firmly, like me firmly holding on to this podium or this microphone or my $2 I don't want to lose. You know, hold that real tight. 
It says also, or closely, I always have my phone real close, keeping it, don't want to lose it. It says, or loyally, loyal to whatever I'm loyal to. And unwaveringly, I'm unwaveringly in my attendance to my job. So Monday through Friday, I will be there. So I'm not wavering. It's not like this week I'm not there, next week I'm not there, then after that I'm there. They just expect me to be there, and I expect me to be there. So that's when you're unwaveringly. So this word cleave, putting that back into that scripture, it says abhor, which is turn away from that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. So the mind of Christ tonight, which is what we're talking about, the mind of Christ, when you let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, you will cleave or adhere firmly to that which is good. When you let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, you will closely hold the things that are good to you. And these things that are good are not our opinion. This good is what's good in God's sight. That's the difference. We've always held close to things that were good to us. Every last one of us in here held close to whatever we thought was good. Most of it was bad in God's sight, but we held close to it because it was good to us. That's why we got to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. It said that we will be loyal to the things that are good, that God says is good. And lastly, in the definition, we will be unwaveringly but we won't waver in the things that are good. We'll find ourselves going, as the Bible says, from strength to strength. Where you continue to go to higher heights and deeper depths. The cliche that all, almost all of us have heard in church. Higher heights and deeper depths. Higher heights, deeper depths in God. Higher heights in the spirit, deeper in the word. And so when you don't waver, you just keep going up and up and up and up. But when you waver, you up today, down tomorrow. Only the Holy Ghost can keep us from wavering. Because the Bible says we are kept by the power of God through faith. Talking about that measure of faith again. Unto what? Salvation. The Holy Spirit can keep you. That's how you can do these things. That's how Jesus was kept. So the Holy Spirit will keep you. He'll help you not to waver and falter when the cares of life and the situations come up as they do in all of us. And so if we continue on tonight, the next scripture says, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. That's why I'm so happy to see everybody. It's the Spirit put this kindness and this affection toward one another. And it's a brotherly love. And when it's a brotherly love, you're just as happy to see the brothers as you are the sisters. When it's not a brotherly love, you're probably happy to see the opposite sex. I'm talking about living holy tonight. When it's not a godly love, you're happy to see whoever you're happy to see for whatever reason you're happy to see them for. And they can either draw you to the church for them or draw you away. But when you have this, this mind of Christ, you'll be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor. It'll be honorable. And then you'll prefer one another. I'm so glad when I see everybody walking here. I don't know what y'all been going through all day. I have no idea. Unless the Spirit reveals something, I ain't even worried about all that. I'm just glad to see y'all tonight. The Bible says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. It goes on to say, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Talking about having the mind of Christ tonight. As it was saying earlier, examine ourselves, and it's according to the measure of faith. And so as we're going through these different words, you should be examining yourself, not just hearing my voice, but examining yourself as I examine myself. What I'm teaching to you, I'm teaching to myself. What I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. And so what I'm doing, reading this to you, when I read not slothful in business, I said, well, Lord, am I slothful in business? In business, and slothful is slow, whereas the Spirit might be saying, or God might be telling the Holy Ghost, I need you to go do this today. And then myself, I'm like, oh, I can do that next week. And then I wonder why, whatever for me, talking about myself tonight, it doesn't work out. God said, I told you to move yesterday. And you didn't move, so I gave that to Brother Brooks. I gave that to you. And I'm sitting around wondering, well, good Lord, when is my turn to be blessed? He said, I was trying to bless you. So when I read that, I said to myself, examining myself, am I slowful? And if I am, Lord, help me. 
And I went down the next one in my mind, fervent in spirit. Fervent is like, whoa, you get fired up. There was a time when I wasn't fervent for nothing for God. I was ready to go all the time. But then one day the Holy Ghost came in. And then some of y'all saw on Sunday, Pastor Burt, Pastor Lindsey Burt was here from Lombard, Illinois. And she was fired up. And the service was a blessing. She was fervent in the spirit. And even as I was standing, I was like, oh, I need some of that. I was examining myself. Because there are higher heights, and it's according to the measure of faith you have. I'm like, whatever called her to be fervent, she got a great measure of faith in that. That's why the Bible said, think soberly about it. I couldn't stand there and be like, well, I got more faith than she got. It's like, no, if I'm sober about it, no. She's on fire for God. Lord, help me. So then I went down the list, as I just read to you, it says, serving the Lord. Am I serving the Lord? Yes, I am. So then I said, well, Lord, help me serve even better. I'm talking about what I was thinking when I just read this to you. This is how you examine yourself. This is what's supposed to happen. This is what God does. When, when he sees us, we hear the scriptures, he then examines us. And Jesus even knows our heart and our mind. So it's a lot going on when you're in here that you can't see with your own eyes. It says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. When you need prayer, do you pray? When somebody else needs prayer, do you pray? I begin to think soberly about that about myself, and I began to ask myself years ago when this was taught to me, Lord, help me be instant in prayer. And I went from, it never crossed my mind to pray for somebody, because my relationship, my level of faith might have been a level two. It just never crossed my mind it was somebody else's job to pray. Then I was like, Lord, I want to pray for them. And it was like, the spirit like, well, you need to get closer. I need you to level up. So then I leveled up in God. I'm just going to throw out a number. Maybe I was level five. But I wasn't instant in prayer yet. Because then I would say, I'm going to keep you in prayer. It was much better than owe you a little faith. But there was more. And as we grow, you begin to live this when the Holy Ghost comes in. And so by the grace of God, it's, some of y'all have seen it. Even standing in here, everyone in here has probably seen you tell me something. And then I'll be like, can I pray for you now? The Spirit's helping me be instant in prayer. I would say, well, I'll keep you in prayer. But the Spirit, he speaks and no, pray right now. So I want to encourage you as you examine yourself. If that's not you, that's not a problem. The problem is, if it's not you and you say, I don't want that to be me. But if you say to yourself tonight, I'm not a lot of this, Pastor Harris is saying. But Lord, I want to be. Then God can help you. He can help you have this mind of Christ. And it says in 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given the hospitality. I was not always that. Since Pastor Harris will tell you, there was a time when Saturday was my time. Don't call me. Don't ask me. I ain't coming. I ain't praying for you. I ain't fasting. I ain't doing nothing. Saturday was my time. But then one day, I was sober about this thing. As we're closing tonight, I begin to really believe what the Bible says. And I begin to look at it soberly. And I begin to say to myself, well, if the Bible said I need to do this because Jesus said I need to do this, then if I think soberly or honestly about it, if I'm not doing this, I'm not going to make it in. And then I was so sober in my mind, said, Lord, whatever it is you're telling me to do, just help me. Because at the end of the day, I can't get in because my mother loves me. I can't get in because Bishop Edwards loves me. I can't get in because the elders love me. I can't get in because I got a suit. But I have to get in because of the word of God. And so all these things that we're reading tonight, if you see people in any church, this church included, that isn't doing this, it's not because the word of God isn't true. It's because their level of faith has not been increased. So when you see your brother and your sister in God, or you think about the people you know that are in other churches. If they're not doing this, this isn't a Bible for new life. This isn't my doctrine. This is the word of God. If they're not doing this, now you should have an insight as to why they're not living what they're preaching. Why they're not living what they're hearing, no matter who it is. Gave a testimony over the weekend about the pastor that married us. Came up to Assistant Pastor Harrison and asked her, pray for me. I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The pastor said that. Big church. A lot of people. I knew all of them. I didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. I had no idea. He asked her, and she didn't know him, but she was in the spirit. And he realized, and they didn't have no conversation. He just walked up and asked her. And so when, when, when you see people live a certain way, 
Now you know it's according to the measure of faith. So however you're living tonight, myself included, I'm like, Lord, increase my faith. Because again, the apostles ask Jesus that. So, so don't be discouraged tonight. That's what God wants you to say. He wants me to ask. And so as we close tonight, he says, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. That's a commandment. Lord, increase my faith. Because I had an arsenal of words for them. I had some dark imaginations for them. We were driving back from Atlanta last weekend. And we were in the funeral line. Military funeral for Bishop Edwards. My pastor passed away. From where I received the Holy Ghost, where I was saved, 17 years. And we were in this funeral line, Atlanta, Georgia. And cars kept driving in the funeral line, just getting in, just rude. I mean, we had to slam on brakes, blow the horn, and they was looking at our face like, what you going to do about it? And I told them, my whole family, I said, I thank God I have the Holy Ghost. I said, because when I wasn't saved, I would have got out of the car. I would have threw a brick through the window. I'm just telling y'all, I'm being honest. And I said, I probably would have got shot. Because <laughs> nowadays you get shot. It ain't like in the old days. You just fight real good, and you go home and tell everybody about it, and they be like, yeah, you know, that's Mike Tyson right now. You get shot. So I thank God for the Holy Ghost, because I would have done some things that were not pleasing to God that would have made it so I wouldn't make it in and probably wouldn't be alive today. But it says, bless them which persecute you, Bless and curse not. So I said, Lord, help them. Lord, save them. Lord, fill them with the Spirit. They don't understand what they're doing. Because again, as we start out tonight, God's will is that everybody should come to repentance. That everybody should be saved. That's the mind of Christ. That's the mind that God gave him. And so I said, Lord, increase my faith because I don't feel like blessing. I know what I would do, but Lord, what would you have me to do? The Bible says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Rejoice when people rejoice. And be touched enough to weep when they weep. So when y'all go through, by the grace of God, I go through with you. And when y'all are happy about something, by the help of the Holy Ghost, I am happy for you and happy with you. And that's the mind of Christ. And that's what God wants to give each and every person, not just in this church, but everyone that's in the church of God, which is God's church. Any church, no matter what the name is, where they're teaching the gospel of their salvation with the same Holy Ghost, the same Jesus God wants to have, them to have that mind as well. And that's why in the next verse, be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. I am not wise. I have, I have been sober about this. I have concluded to myself, I'm not wise unless the Holy Ghost help me. I'm not wise unless the Spirit gives it to me. Because otherwise I'm wise in my own conceit, in my own mind. But maybe God is saying, you know, there was another way I wanted to do that. But I think I know exactly how things should go. Talk about the mind of Christ. Jesus said he was about his father's business, to do his father's will. He said, I came down from heaven to do the will of the Father. So Jesus wasn't wise in his own. He always asked God to, to lead him and guide him and give him what to say. And as we, we increase our faith, you'll find yourself on the job. That's where it first began to me, for me, because I knew how to do my job. But I said, you know what, Lord, show me a better way. Show me what to say and what not to say. And it says in the next verse, recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things which are honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, everybody that's here tonight, as we get ready to close and stand. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. That's the wrath of God. So don't you go in and have wrath. It says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. This is God saying this. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. According to your measure of faith tonight, examine yourselves. How much vengeance do you have on the inside? What does it take for you to have vengeance? I had a quick moment of vengeance in the car, in the funeral line. The old man was there, I said, I will mess them up. 
I told them, I said, I wish I had like an old 1932 Chevy, big body metal box that can't take this. I said, I'll run it to all of them. God said, thou fool. <laughs> That's what the Bible said last week. God himself said, thou fool. Like I'm going to enter in thinking like that. But that was in my mind. And I said, Lord, help me. Because those thoughts haven't came in in a long time. Yes, Pastor Harris sitting in the car. I said, yes, Lord, you are revealing things unto me. Because the Bible says, if anything ye be otherwise minded, he will reveal it unto you. And I found myself, if my, my faith increased, I found myself, man, Lord, reveal these things unto me. Lord, help me. So when it comes up and it comes out, that's the time that God said, there it is. What you going to do with it? I could have stewed and said, yeah, just wait. We got good insurance, babe. Hold on, put that seatbelt tight. I'm going in. But I said, no, help me, Lord. And as I close with 21, that's where we are finishing tonight. He says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Don't feed him poison food. Feed him some good stuff so he can live or she can live. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Don't do your own thing to try to get back at somebody. Do good. And in doing good, you're going to reap coals of fire on the head. It's like, good gosh, I have tried to destroy him. I have lied. I have said all these things. I have been against him. I have corralled a whole bunch of people against him. And they gave, they, they gave me a Christmas present. They came in with a smile and told me happy birthday. They helped me close out on the job. You know, they could have went home early, but they stayed. It says, in doing so, you will reap coals of fire on their head. And this is what it says in the end. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. All these things, this is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's according to your measure of faith. You're in the faith. You are in the church that teaches nothing but the Bible. I tell you all the time, you can live with something else. I'm sorry, I ain't got nothing else for you. I don't want to meet you to heaven. I got nothing else for you. I might have got some snacks sometimes. But outside of that, all I got is the word. So you are in the faith. Now it's time to examine ourselves to see our own measure of faith and ask God to add the increase. And then you will find yourself growing in the Lord. You'll find yourself closer to God. You'll find yourself making sure that in that great day when Jesus comes back, You'll get called up to meet him in the air on the cloud. And if you happen to pass away before that day, you will find yourself being resurrected to live forever with him. Either way, whether he comes tonight and we are alive, or he comes a thousand years from now and we pass on, you're going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's the goal, that you will end up in heaven. Amen. I ask that you would all stand tonight. Tonight's Bible study was titled, the Mind of Christ, Part 2. So I encourage everyone to come back next Tuesday for Bible study as we will be on the Mind of Christ, Part 3. Talking about what the Mind of Christ is so we can make sure we think like Him, we live like Him, we walk like Him, and we'll be like Him. And that in the end, we'll be where He is right now in heaven. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus.